The War on Drugs is a deceptive name for what has really become a war on the American people through the government's assault on human freedom, the prison system, and all taxpayers. Despite nearly four decades of battling against the use and selling of drugs, the government's so-called war on drugs, both at home and abroad, has largely been a failure. The tide of drugs imported into this country has not slowed, despite astronomical spending by the government and the imprisonment of record numbers of Americans, often for the possession of insignificant amounts of recreational drugs. Legislators, police, and prosecutors have encouraged judges to lock up more and more Americans, causing prisons to be bursting at the seams and ruining countless lives, a great many of them among racial minorities. The government lie is hardly new. In fact, the war on drugs is, in effect, a reincarnation of prohibition. The sale of all alcoholic beverages was outlawed in 1920 with the passage of the 18th Amendment. Closing the legal market on something that consumers desire simply opened up a black market. And in the 1920s, there was a great deal of corruption and violence caused by the government's ban. It actually created the lawlessness that characterized the era. Consequently, gangs and organized crime flourished. By 1921, the murder rate in America jumped. After seemingly recognizing the harm that prohibition had caused, the United States enacted the 21st Amendment in 1933 to allow people to drink as they pleased. After prohibition was repealed, the homicide rate began to fall. This is not a coincidence. After the alcohol ban was repealed, much of the organized crime that was facilitated by prohibition simply switched businesses and entered into the illegal drug market. Today, several decades after the war on drugs commenced, the black market for drugs is thriving. The parallels between today's prohibition and yesterday's prohibition are glaringly obvious and point to the government's severe case of amnesia and to its Victorian attitude about our bodies, except that this time the stakes are higher. In our 21st century global economy, the violence is not confined to the U.S., it is worldwide. Ironically, in its metaphoric war on the use of drugs, the government has facilitated actual wars, actual violence, and actual death. It's about time that the government put its weapons and our cash down and began to use some common sense. The United States spends at least $40 billion a year on costs directly related to the drug war, and then several billion more in indirect costs. The costs of spraying Colombian crops, of hiring numerous DEA and other government employees, of locking up more people on drug charges than all of Western Europe locks up on all charges combined, are astronomical. And these are only the direct costs. What about the welfare dependence that comes from creating a class of people who have drug-related crimes on their records and often cannot obtain employment? The drug war is indeed perpetuating a harrowing cycle for people with drug use or drug sales in their past. For example, let's say you were charged with sales and then were forced to spend some time in jail. Once you served your time or were released from prison, you decide to apply for some jobs. When you fill out employment applications, you are asked whether you have had a criminal record. If you check the yes box, chances are that you won't be the employer's first choice. If you check the no box, you are lying and could get into further trouble if the employer does a background check or finds out that you lied. There are no great options here. Then, because you cannot find a legitimate job, it is difficult to make a living. This makes turning to the sale of drugs an easy and almost sensible option, even if that is not the choice you wanted to make. The point is that when the government locks ordinary people away for committing non-violent, non-victim, harmless drug crimes, it sets people up for repeat offenses. It also makes welfare a very plausible option. Either way, taxpayer money goes to the huge cost of filling prisons or the huge cost of supporting people and their families when the breadwinner is imprisoned or unemployable. And the cycle generally does not end with one person. Children who grow up in houses where their parents are drug dealers, in housing projects, and on welfare, generally are not primed to have the brightest futures. They grow up around these things, and this lifestyle becomes normalized and passed on.
Whole generations of families grow up around this, and it is unhealthy, dangerous, and expensive. This cycle is detrimental, and the government's holier-than-thou values have been unable to stop it. The drug war keeps going and going and going, regardless of who is in power, Republican, Democrat, liberal, or conservative. The war on drugs has been happening for four decades. Why? Is the government so arrogant and stubborn that it can't look at the statistical information and see that these policies simply do not work? Do politicians just like squandering our money? The government knows these policies do not work. Yet politicians lie to us and wax poetic about eliminating the use of drugs because it sounds like a good thing to say from a stump. Politicians like to speak about the war on drugs because combating drugs sounds moral. Advocating for a drug-free society generally helps this image and is something the public wants to hear. Public enemy number one in the United States is drug abuse. Drugs are menacing our society. They're threatening our values and undercutting our institutions. They're killing our children. Last February, I asked for a $700 million increase in the drug budget for the coming year. And now, over the past six months of careful study, we have found an immediate need for another billion and a half dollars. With this added $2.2 billion, our 1990 drug budget totals almost $8 billion, the largest increase in history. Politicians are afraid to veer away from it. The mainstream public is afraid to disagree. Basically, we all waste $40 billion a year to keep up a useless, ineffective appearance. Anyone who picks up a newspaper, tabloid, watches TV, or goes on the Internet could tell you that politicians are far from angels. They have affairs. They steal money. They gamble. They drink to excess. Many have even used drugs that they themselves have voted to make illegal. And the truth is, many ordinary American people have used drugs as well. For this is the reason that the war on drugs is such a large enterprise. At its heart, the war on drugs is about false morality and personal freedom. People do risky things every day. Sure, some people are more averse to risk than others, and would never climb a mountain or go bungee jumping. Yet some people love doing these death-defying stunts, and their quality of life would be damaged without doing them. Drugs are not much different. Once you take the government's sense of morality out of the equation and simply look at drugs as dangerous and addictive substances, drugs are really not much different than other risks. So instead of spouting on and on about the morality of this issue, shouldn't politicians take on the cause of freedom? Government lies to us when it tells us the drug war is for our own good, or when it tells us that the war on drugs is working. The government lies to us by covering up what the drug war is actually about. Image, power, and usurping the right of Americans. Anthony Gregory, senior researcher at the Independent Institute, a free market think tank in Oakland, California, eloquently wrote, The ideology of the war on drugs is the ideology of totalitarianism, of communism, of fascism, and of slavery. In practice, it has made an utter mockery of the rule of law and the often spouted idea that America is the freest country on earth. The United States has one of the highest per capita prison populations in the world, second only to Rwanda, thanks largely to the drug war, all while its federal government imposes its drug policies on other countries by methods ranging from mere diplomatic bullying to spraying foreign crops with lethal poison, from bribing foreign heads of state to bankrolling and whitewashing acts of mass murder conducted by despots in the name of fighting drugs. The government uses the drug war to justify taking away our rights guaranteed by the Fourth Amendment of the United States Constitution, which prohibits unreasonable searches and seizures, and bars search warrants on anything but those based upon probable cause of criminal activity and issued by judges. Since the war on drugs began almost four decades ago, most searches and seizures reaching the United States Supreme Court have been approved. According to Yale Law School professor Stephen Duke, the court has held that a search based on an invalid warrant does not require any remedy so long as the police acted in good faith. So people can be stopped in their cars or in airports, trains, or buses, and then submitted to questioning or held to be sniffed by dogs. Police may search an open field without warrant or cause, even if trespassing on it would otherwise be a criminal offense. 
Police may use helicopters to look into our homes and backyards, private property they could not lawfully or constitutionally enter without a search warrant. They can search our garbage bags without giving a reason, and if they have reasonable suspicion, the police may search our bodies. The erosion of our Fourth Amendment rights caused by the war on drugs has not been confined to cases involving drugs either, Duke explains. The pressure to uphold police activities in drug cases generates new principles that thereafter apply to everyone, whether or not drugs are involved. If the police are authorized to search for drugs on suspicion, they can also search for evidence of tax evasion, gambling, mail fraud, pornography, bribery, and any other offense. The putative object of a police search does not limit what can be confiscated. If police conduct is a lawful search, they can take and use any evidence they see, however unrelated it may be to what got them into the home or the body in the first place. So, even people who have never touched a drug in their lives are subject to the loss of Fourth Amendment rights brought about by the war on drugs because a supine judiciary, cowed by the need to appear anti-drugs, has lowered the bar for what police conduct is lawful and constitutional.